Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tyler's PhD Defense. Uh, Tyler is a, a student co-advised by Dr. David Mola and uh, me. Uh, I'm from the Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering. And uh, Tyler has done some excellent job uh, for his uh, PhD program uh, in the area of uh, uh, drone hyperspectral imaging for core nitrogen management. And he also does a lot of meaningful exploration in the area of uh, uh, EONR. And uh, now I will uh, let Fabian uh, talk to uh, start our, uh, uh, start Tyler's seminar soon. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, great to, to have Tyler uh, come to this step in his uh, um, degree. He has done a lot of great work and uh, um, I'm just looking forward to his presentation. I am serving as the, uh, as the chair for his examining committee and um, as uh, Cien said, uh, he's been working with, uh, with her and David Mola and um, has done a lot of work uh, related to Precision Act with uh, nitrogen management. And um, we'll just uh, let Tyler take it from here. Uh, I know he has a lot of great material. He has a very good... Um, dissertation and his presentation, I'm sure will have a lot of great insights. So with uh, any more delay, uh, please uh, Tyler, take it over. Okay, thank you Fabian and thank you uh, C for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so uh, the title of my dissertation is Precision Nitrogen Management for Corn, Uncertainty in the Optimal Rate and Accuracy of Drone Hyperspectral Imaging in Predicting Uptake. So I'd like to just thank everybody for joining today. I'm really excited to be here and finally get to this point to uh, defend and, and share everything I've done uh, in the last six years or so. And so I'd like to just start by uh, thanking and acknowledging uh, my two advisors, Dr. C. Yang and David Mola. So today I'm gonna, I, I have four research chapters here that I'm gonna talk about. Um, chapters one and two really focus more on uh, the economic optimum nitrogen rate, uncertainty, and uh, some social costs that I'm, I'm considering. Uh, whereas chapters three and four uh, have the, the remote sensing aspect using hyperspectral aerial imagery to predict nitrogen uptake. So now I'm unfortunately gonna focus more on uh, three and four, um, just I've got a lot of content and so, but I do wanna present some results of you know, each chapter. So there's uh, something for everyone here. So first I'll start off with uh, motivation and scope for the, the dissertation uh, research. And I just wanna start with the nitrogen cycle. Um, at the center of the nitrogen cycle figure here is uh, a corn crop. And I really, our goals are to optimize yield and minimize nitrogen loss. You know, depending who you are, where you're coming from, I think those are uh, both goals that everyone can really get behind. The challenge is, uh, you know, optimizing for both because of the complexity. We, we recognize that this nitrogen cycle is very complex. It's difficult to keep an inventory on all the different pools. The reactive nitrogen is always moving around and we're adding fertilizer. Uh, nitrogen is being made available from the organic matter through mineralization. Uh, but then there's all these loss pathways. Uh, and then to top things off, we have special spatial variability due to topography, soils, and temporal variability, really driven by weather. And then the interaction between the two just making this a very, very complicated problem. And uh, I just want to also now just look at a, a diagram of nitrogen use uh, throughout the season. Um, we see from this, the, the red curve just kind of illustrates uh, this general nitrogen use and it just gradually increases from planting until it reaches a peak right around uh, late July uh, in August sometime. And, you know, looking also at the annual rainfall pattern, um, we see that uh, we're more susceptible to nitrogen loss early on in the season, uh, you know, because of these drivers. And delaying a nitrogen fertilizer application into the season um, helps us to avoid that. And then it also gives us the opportunity to adjust the rate and possibly even the source, uh, you know, to do some extra management, or, you know, nitrogen management strategies. Um, and so this whole concept is, is more or less, I think, what at least the remote sensing part of this, uh, of my research is really focused on. 
So the overarching goal of the dissertation is, is really, a, it's a pretty old goal, improve our ability to make nitrogen fertilizer recommendations. Uh, there's two sides of this, I think, you know, there's producer concerns, which, you know, we're trying to maximize profits. And then what I'm calling non-producer concerns, you know, and these are just things like uh, societal impacts. We want to minimize nitrogen loss to the environment, minimize the pollution that comes from that. Now, as I mentioned, I've got two main research topics, uh, the economic optimal nitrogen rate, uh, and really looking at quantifying the uncertainty around that value. And then also uh, considering externalities, considering uh, some social cost of nitrogen, you know, the cost of the pollution from that nitrogen, and kind of really taking it from an agronomic perspective. Uh, the second research topic has to do with uh, remote sensing using hyperspectral aerial imagery to uh, predict nitrogen uptake. Okay, so getting into uh, the research, um, I'm going to start out uh, uh, with a chapter published in Computers and Electronics and Agriculture um, two years ago. Uh, the title is Computing Uncertainty in the Optimum Nitrogen Rate Using a Generalized Cost Function. So now a little bit of background on the EONR um, is it's, it's just to make the most favorable nitrogen fertilizer recommendation considering really three variables. The first uh, is the, the grain yield response to nitrogen. <clears throat> this is the blue curve on, on the plot here. And how do we get this? We put in a field trial, we put many different nitrogen rates out, and then we measure yield at the end of the year. And then we plot that, we model, the relationship and we get the blue line. The other two considerations are grain price and fertilizer costs. These together make up the price ratio and they really uh, drive or they, they make up the, the economic scenario. So either grain price or fertilizer cost can fluctuate, but really it's the price ratio that dictates what the EONR uh, is. So looking at this curve, we have the blue gross return to nitrogen line. The green represents the fertilizer nitrogen costs. And so we acknowledge, okay, we're paying money for that fertilizer. The difference between the gross and the costs um, is our net return to nitrogen, this red line. And the, the, opt or the, the maximum point on this line is our EONR value or our maximum return to nitrogen value. So in this case, um, it's 131 pounds of nitrogen per acre corresponding to a return of about $200 per acre. So the objectives of this work were to calculate the uncertainty around this estimated EONR value. And then second, consider some externalities in the optimal nitrogen rate calculation, such as the social costs from uh, nitrogen pollution from excess nitrogen. So first on the uncertainty aspect, uh, I just wanna use a uh, list out some methods to compute the uncertainty. And I'm gonna start with this plus or minus $1 um, return per acre return. Uh, there's no statistical basis for this, so it's not really uncertainty. Um, I'm putting it here though because it's oftentimes expressed as an uncertainty um, and it's not necessarily malicious or anything like that, but I think it is very misleading. Um, it's just a, a way to express, uh, you know, this is the re it, it helps to manage a farmer or a producer risk in, in their, uh, in what rate they would apply on either side of the economic optimum rate. Now, in terms of actually calculating the uncertainty, uh, there's three main methods, a walled type, bootstrapping, and profile likelihood. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of the details of these, but there's trade-offs among them. They go from more simple to more complex, but the gold standard is this profile likelihood approach. Uh, uses a sum of squares and is an iterative approach comparing against the EONR and then iteratively away from the EONR until we no longer have a statistically significant relationship. Okay, now second, uh, the social cost of nitrogen. This is defined as the present value of monetary damages caused by an incremental increase in nitrogen. A lot of work by uh, Bonnie Keeler here at the University of Minnesota um, in recent years. And, you know, there's some, the, the biggest thing that I want to point out is, you know, besides that, you know, there's some of this work being done and the social cost of nitrogen being put, you know, applied and kind of uh, put, put a, a quantity put to it. Um, you know, the other thing I want to point out is just the magnitude of this social costs. And so, you know, we see, we see that, you know, there's some areas that are really dark and this is $5, $10, $50. And this is in units of kilograms of nitrogen applied. Um, so quite substantial, you know, some of these uh, social cost estimates. So to address this, I created a, a Python package, uh, it's called EONR. Um, the EONR uh, package computes the optimal nitrogen rate 
and its confidence intervals. Uh, it supports both quadratic, quadratic plateau models, uses a generalized cost function, so we can consider some of these externalities. The only inputs are, you know, your field, your nitrogen rate response data from a field trial. So nitrogen rate and yield. And then you can add in different assumptions for grain price, fertilizer cost, consider social costs of nitrogen, choose which confidence intervals you want to use, which type. There's all that, that sort of flexibility. Uh, and so, you know, then we can produce a plot like I just showed, and then another output is, you know, more of a tabular version. Uh, and so this table is uh, really showing, okay, we, we use this UNR tool three times, and so we can compare different economic scenarios. If we want to, we can, can compare different sites. And this is representing the agronomic optimum nitrogen rate, where we're considering only the price of grain, uh, the ec economic optimum, considering fertilizer as well, and then the socially optimum, considering the social costs. And then we can yeah, use it to calculate the optimum nitrogen rate. And then, of course, the confidence intervals. And this is like the, the, the big thing, the, the important thing, I think, that um, this tool just helps to make this really easy. Um, like I said, we just put in our assumptions and then our, our data and um, the results are there. So this EONR Python package makes it easy to report uncertainty using any of the methods, any confidence interval we'd like, and possible to consider externalities, um, the social cost of nitrogen. And it has a nice uh, interface, I suppose, to make graphs and get, a, get your tables and everything like that. So for more information on this, uh, I'd say go to the documentation, eonr.readthedocs. Uh, there's tutorials, a full description of features and API. It's all hosted on GitHub. And again, the, the details of, of you know, all the equations that went into these calculations published in computers and electronics in agriculture. Okay, so moving on uh, to chapter two. The social cost of nitrogen, acknowledging the gap between the economic and socially optimum rate. So this research was really inspired by previous work that quantified the social cost of nitrogen at various scales. So I mentioned, you know, I showed that slide on the social cost of nitrogen. You know, I really wanted to take, uh, you know, take that, but like from an agronomic perspective, from the variability that we see from field to field, from year to year, right here in Minnesota. Um, so the first uh, objective here was to quantify the uncertainty around the EONR. Uh, second, evaluate the relationship between EONR and grain yield. Uh, this is important, I think, because we have to do a better job of being able to predict EONR and finding this optimum rate. Um, and so just kind of like a data exploration task to do that. Uh, and then third, quantify the net nitrogen saved that would result from applying, you know, what we call a socially optimum nitrogen rate instead of the economic optimum nitrogen rate. So considering the social costs, you know, how does that compare to the EONR and, you know, what are the, the impacts of that? Okay, so to, to do this, uh, I had uh, 10 trials across uh, uh, southern Minnesota, uh, four following corn, four following soybean, and then one of each following rye and sweet corn. Uh, they covered, uh, seven of them were in clay loam soils, two silt loam soils, and uh, one in a loam soil. Eight nitrogen rates in each experiment, and the max rate uh, ranged from 235 to 404, depending on the previous crop and what was recommended there generally. Uh, four of these experiments, uh, three at Wasika and one at Stewart, had a nitrogen timing treatment. And for the purpose of this analysis, they were analyzed as a separate EONR data set. So we had pre-plant analyzed separately from the pre-plant plus V5 nitrogen applications and the uh, pre-plant plus V10. So on to the results. And so here we're seeing um, a, a figure. I just want to draw your attention on the left side here. These are all of the, the sites. Uh, nitrogen application timing and then the year. And then on the x-axis uh, is uh, grain yield and focusing in on the box plots, which represent the grain yield. Uh, we see quite a distribution in, in mean grain yield that range from 8.5 to 14.2 megagrams per hectare. And then the EONR is plotted by the points on the, the upper x-axis. Um, and so we've got the points, which is the estimated EONR. And then the line represents the 90% uh, confidence interval around that point. These EONR calculations use a 5.6 price ratio, which is a 0 0.10 imperial price ratio for those that are more familiar with that system. Um, and uh, yeah, the estimated EONR uh, across all these sites ranged from 68 to 394 kilograms per hectare. So quite a wide range um, in estimated EONR values. 
As far as the confidence intervals, the range between the lower and the upper 90% confidence interval, so more or less the length of this line around each point, the range of these intervals range from 42 kilograms, the narrowest, to 485 kilograms per hectare, uh, the widest. So really a very wide range there in our uncertainty in a lot of these. Okay, moving on to the second objective, um, the relationship between the EONR and grain yield. And now I just want to reiterate, you know, like I, I want to look at these things because I think it's important to be able to predict EONR. We have to find relationships in the data with EONR so then we can uh, make better, uh, understand the UNR better in the future, you know, for future growing seasons. Um, and so is what I did here is I took many grain yield metrics and just uh, plotted them against EONR. Um, and I'm only going to show a few, but I'll kind of give you the highlights here. Um, the first thing I'm showing here is the grain yield at EONR. So we did, our, we calculated the EONR. What was the grain yield there? Um, we know from a lot of past work, there's really no relationship here. This data didn't show anything different, a uh, very weak relationship. Uh, down here on the, the lower left, this plot uh, shows uh, the grain yield at the zero nitrogen rate. So, you know, just that control plot against what the E1R was. And there's actually a, a fair relationship here, an R value of uh, negative 0.7. So as E1R increased, the grain yield at the zero rate, you know, we saw a general decrease. So, you know, in looking at this, I think the high points, and I, I apologize, I don't have time to show all the data, but the strongest relationship with EONR uh, was the, the grain yield interquartile range. And so I just want to, the takeaway here, the R value is 0.84, a pretty uh, strong relationship. Now, I, I also want to point out that these metrics, all of them actually, except for one, all of them require a full range yield response to nitrogen experiments. So we have to implement that trial to calculate EONR to really get at what it is. The exception is this grain yield at zero N, the one I showed down and left. The reason I bring this up is purely practical implications. It's a lot easier just to like if, if you know if, if we can use this as a covariate of some sort to help with an EONR estimate. Having just a you know a single zero rate is a lot easier than putting a full full blown trial out. Okay, and now moving on to the the third uh, objective of this chapter. Uh, the socially optimum nitrogen rate. So for this analysis, I looked at three different uh, social cost functions. Um, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to just kind of gloss over the assumptions under each one. I'll just say that the assumptions are different. Um, and you know, the, the what I tried to do here was consider a different set of assumptions for, for calculating the social costs. Um, and then that resulted in different private losses for the producer, different social gains, you know, all together based on the assumptions. And then when we compare the economic optimum nitrogen rate to the, the socially optimum nitrogen rate, we get this ni net nitrogen saved. And so I did this, um, I calculated net nitrogen saved, private loss, uh, social gain for each of these cost functions. Um, and again, I'm just going to point out just one highlight here, uh, kind of glossing over a lot of the details. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things, I think, to look at here. And that is this net nitrogen fertilizer savings. And so again, this is just the difference between the EONR and the SONR. So if we were to apply the socially optimum rate instead of the economic optimum rate, you know, how much nitrogen was saved? Um, and so these different cost functions, we see a different nitrogen fertilizer savings, um, you know, this cost function A had the most savings and cost function B had the least savings. Now, what I want to point out here and tying back to the first objective of this uh, experiment uh, is this range in our confidence intervals. The, the upper, lower and upper 90% confidence intervals uh, range from 42 to 485 kilograms per hectare. And so when we kind of just look at that uh, next to, you know, the social cost savings, the uh, the magnitude the magnitude of our uncertainty is sometimes you know depending on the assumptions we use sometimes three times four times as high and the best case scenario is is what uh, we're actually saving you know depending on which uh, social cost function is is used so the conclusions from this chapter uh, we saw that EONR has a moderately strong relationship with uh, interquartile range uh, of grain yield which I didn't show but I told you <laughs> and a fair relationship with grain yield at zero nitrogen 
Second, the 90% confidence intervals of the EONR were both very wide and they're variable across data sets, ranged from 42 to 485 kilograms per hectare. Third, the range of the narrowest 90% confidence interval. So this is like the best case scenario or our lowest uncertainty. The, this range was greater than the mean and the median net nitrogen saved as a socially optimum nitrogen rate. And so this is across any of the social cost functions. And so the question I ask, you know, when, you know, when looking at that is, is, uh, is uncertainty in the EONR and then thus the SONR, is that uncertainty driving the social costs that we're seeing? Another way to say this is, is, is our lack of ability to really understand and measure the nitrogen cycle and put on, estimate the optimum nitrogen rate and then see that through by applying exactly the right rate, is that you know resulting in you know excess nitrogen being applied and you know really driving these social costs? You know, is is and uh, I kind of look at it from a perspective of <clears throat> um, you know if producers they're putting on nitrogen fertilizer. A lot of times it's a, they look at it as a cheap insurance, and um, instead of uh, be, because of the economic scenario, it oftentimes uh, it just is is the easiest just to apply a little bit of extra. Um, but really, the problem is, I think, in not being able to understand a lot of the things with the nitrogen cycle itself. Uh, so, anyways, uh, fourth conclusion here: uh, the method for calculating social gains is critically important. Um, and so, just want to point out, you know, like if someday down the road a policy is implemented. Uh, improper calculation of social gains may result in private losses without necessarily improving social gains. And so I didn't get into a lot of this, but I just wanted to point, point that out. Okay, and so that concludes the, the UNR portion of this and now on to the remote sensing portion. So chapter three of my dissertation titled, Prediction of Early Season Nitrogen Uptake in Maize Using High Resolution Aerial Hyperspectral Imagery. Now this work was published last year in Remote Sensing. So <clears throat> uh, I just wanna start out with a little bit of background about remote sensing. Um, and so we're seeing an image up here, an aerial image of, uh, of uh, corn plants at an early growth stage. And we can see that, you know, when we look at soil versus uh, the, the tissue, the corn leaf, the reflectance is much different. So we see these different uh, spectral signatures. And so this is just showing uh, percent reflectance across the visible and near infrared regions. And so the concept here is that there's different energy reflected at different wavelengths. And a lot of it is driven by physiological uh, phenomena. And so we can use the spectral information to determine the difference and quantify the difference between a dead leaf, a stressed leaf, and a healthy leaf. <clears throat> so the overall goal of this work is just to predict early season nitrogen uptake using high resolution hyperspectral imagery. Uh, and so I'm gonna go through some of the, the, the methods that I use to do this uh, kind of one at a time. So I'm gonna start in on image capture and data capture. So we used a DJI Matrice 600 uh, Pro drone and we uh, put on this, uh, the hyperspectral camera, a Resonon Pika 2 camera. And in this uh, photo up here, you know, we can see the, the camera. Um, there's also a flight computer uh, to, you know, process all the data. And then there's a solid state drive there, pancaked in between to hold the data. And then also part of this system is an inertial momentum unit, this little red thing, and then a GPS up top. And this is all mounted on a gimbal. And uh, the GPS and the IMU, the inertial system, are used to georeference the imagery uh, when we got them. Some of the specifications of this hyperspectral camera, um, it uh, was uh, <clears throat> sensitive to visible and near infrared light. Um, so normal cameras are only sensitive to visible light, red, green, and blue. This extended into the near infrared region, which is important for uh, vegetative analysis. And then there are 240 bands, 240 spectral channels, um, really 240 different colors that this camera is sensitive to uh, compared to, you know, a normal camera from your cell phone is three colors, red, green, and blue. Okay, so moving on to the ground truth data. So we used uh, three experimental sites um, for, you know, for the collection of this, uh, Wells, Minnesota, 
uh, and then Wasika small plot highlighted here in the gray, and then the Wasika whole field is you know the the gold outlines here. And the biggest thing I want to point out here is yeah we use three experiments uh, because of the different uh, spatial extent of each of these experiments we had to fly the drone at a different altitude. Um, so the small plot you know we could get away with a lower altitude and get higher resolution um, imagery, uh, but the Wasika whole field which is 11.2 hectares in area, we had to fly at 80 meters. And this is a balance between, you know, we want a small pixel size to get the most detail, but we also have a limited battery life. And so we have to plan accordingly. And so this resulted in, you know, several different pixel sizes across all of our data sets, uh, four centimeters for the wells, two to two and a half for Wasika small plot, and then eight centimeters for the Wasika whole field. Uh, across all of these experimental observations that we had, we had two seasons and three experiments. <clears throat> there were 247 total observations used for the model training. Uh, the growth stage ranged from V6 to V14, so this early, early season corn. Image acquisition always occurred within two days of tissue sampling. Image acquisition occurred near solar noon. And then, uh, you know, just some details on our subsampling. So like every, obser uh, every observation that we collected, you know, we took a number, either six or 10 subsamples, uh, whole plant samples, um, dried them down, weighed them, ground them up, sent them into the lab, did the nitrogen extraction. So we had biomass, nitrogen concentration, put them together to get, you know, total nitrogen uptake on a per hectare basis. So that concludes the, the capture uh, material methods and now I'm going to get into the image processing uh, methods that were used uh, and so this is just the overall workflow um, of image processing. Um, we just went through the data collection process and we're going or the, the goal here is to get to the supervised regression where we're using the image data to predict the nitrogen uptake. So uh, now under the image processing we we captured the raw imagery, converted to radiance using the manufacturer calibration file provided by Resonon, the camera manufacturer, and then using the GPS and IMU data, georeferenced the imagery. And then uh, the next step was reflectance conversion. For reflectance conversion, we placed these uh, gray uh, reference panels in the field when we captured the imagery. 50-50 uh, mixture of paint and barium sulfate. And then using that, uh, we applied the empirical line method to convert from the radiance to the reflectance. This is uh, the spectral profile of the re reference panel, really pretty flat, right around 40, 45% reflectance. <clears throat> the next uh, step was to crop the imagery uh, by plot boundaries. So using, you know, building off of the last step, taking the imagery from there, um, we want to uh, crop by field boundary. The idea here is that uh, there are many plots in every image uh, and by cropping by plot boundaries does two things. First, it, it makes sure we don't have any pixels outside of the plot area represented in this plot. So we can only consider these pixels, you know, moving forward. And second, it just allows for much easier processing for all the subsequent steps. We have 247 observations. After this step, we have 247 images that are much smaller than the original images. The next step is the clipping step. Uh, and so this is done on a per pixel basis. So we're just looking at a single pixel here. And then this graph shows the spectral curve for that pixel. Um, we see that there's some really noisy bands near the ends of the spectrum. Uh, and then also, you know, we saw in some cases some noise in these uh, oxygen and water absorption regions. <clears throat> this clip step just removed those bands. So we went from 240 bands originally to 210 bands after this step. Next, the smooth step. Uh, again, on a per pixel basis, so looking at a single pixel, you know, we see a lot of up and down throughout the spectrum. The smooth step just applied a savitsky golay smoothing algorithm. It's a moving window that just smooths out the spectrum. So after smoothing, we get the nice clean orange line. And this uh, generally reduces the noise that we see uh, when, when model training. And then finally, the segmentation step. Uh, so the, the, segment, the, the idea behind segmentation is, okay, we have hundreds, thousands of pixels in each plot area. 
Uh, and we aren't always interested in all of them. Some of the pixels contribute more noise than signal. We want to only keep the pixels that give us the best signal for what we're doing. And so to do that, we want to, in, in my case, I want to do get rid of the soil pixels, the shadow pixels, and any of these mixed pixels that were maybe part soil, part vegetation. Uh, to do this, I use the MCARI2 algorithm uh, or spectral index. The spectral index uses the green band, the red band, and the near infrared band. And the reason MCARI2 was used is because it's sensitive to leaf area index and is rather insensitive to chlorophyll influence. And the second part, insensitivity to chlorophyll influence was important for me because we have these nitrogen response trials and uh, we see a lot of difference in chlorophyll. And I didn't want that to be an extra bias, um, if at all possible in this segmentation step. And so when it came time to actually mask out the unwanted pixels, uh, we looked at every image and any image that had uh, mcarry2 pixel value below the 90th percentile or any pixel that fell below this 90th percentile mcarry2 were masked out so we created the histogram calculated the 90th percentile and then used that as a threshold only kept those pixels that were above the 90th percentile which are those pixels that are most pure vegetation and uh, after that, you know, the, the image processing is done. And finally, we just took the mean reflectance spectra. So any of the pixels that were left over, uh, we just calculated the mean value from all of them, which would have been 10% of all the pixels in the image. And uh, then we used that to, for model training. And so this mean reflectance spectra represents 210 spectral bands, which were then the spectral features used to predict nitrogen uptake. Uh, we didn't use all of them. We did feature selection, but um, they were the the candidates for model training. So now moving on to the, the model training itself, which includes feature selection, hyperparameter tuning, and the cross validation. You know, we started with this full data set, 247 observations, split it into training and testing. Uh, the test set was reserved to independently assess final model performance. And you know, at the end of everything, and then the training set was used for feature selection, hyperparameter tuning, and model training. Uh, and for those steps, you know, we did a repeated stratified k-fold cross validation to get the the right parameters, to get the right number of features, and then to do the the model training. For for feature selection, lasso was used. Uh, this is the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. Hyperparameter tuning, we used a grid search cross validation technique to just search a, a um, feature space to get the best hyperparameters. And then finally, for testing and training, uh, four supervised regression models were used to predict nitrogen uptake. And then, uh, so they were lasso, support vector machine, random fours, and partial least squares. And then obviously we wanted to compare the differences between these to see if any of them were you know, superior to the others. So on to the results. You know, the objective here was to compare these supervised learning algorithms for their ability to predict nitrogen uptake. And so I've got each of these uh, models here, and I'm going to show the results for each. Um, the, the plot is just showing predicted nitrogen uptake on the x-axis, measured on the y-axis, and the, the dashed line is the one-to-one -one line. So a perfect model, we'd have all these points fall right on that one-to-one uh, -one line. The different colors that we're seeing correspond to the different pixel size from the different data sets, uh, the wells, we seek a small plot, et cetera. And the different shapes are the different growth stages. Um, and so we see as growth stages progress, we have more nitrogen uptake, it makes perfect sense. Okay, so the, the lasso model had an R squared value of 0.83, a uh, root mean square error of 15.3, um, which is fairly good. Support vector machine, uh, very similar. Random forest um, had a little bit higher root mean square error, 17.8, and partially squares uh, was similar to lasso and support vector machine. Um, so the takeaways from here, you know, we looked at a range in observed nitrogen uptake from 4.8 to 181.5 kilograms per hectare. Really a pretty wide range, you know, from the V6 to the V14 growth stage. So this model is robust to anything in that, in that area. And uh, the range in root mean square error values uh, was 15.3 to 17.8. Relative root mean square error from 27 to 31%. 
<clears throat> and the lasso SVR and PLS models had comparable for performance, whereas the random forest was a bit inferior. Um, and now the, the second uh, objective of this experiment was to quantify the potential model improvement by including an auxiliary feature derived before the segmentation process. So including an auxiliary feature, I wanna explain this a little bit. Um, and so we have, you know, in, in chapter three, I described this uh, early on in the methods, I described uh, the methods uh, for segmentation. And so we use MCARI2 to basically uh, build this histogram. And then we use the 90th percentile to mask out. And so when looking at this 90th percentile, I thought, well, maybe that can be something that you know gives us, and I could be an auxiliary feature. But when looking from V6, uh, we see 0.43 MCARI2 value at the 90th percentile to V8 um, and V14 this uh, 90th percentile value actually saturates out. So it's 0.89 and V8, and then it actually decreases to 0.88 um, and V14. But we also see that uh, the histograms look very different at V8 and V14. I mean, this makes intuitive sense, like the crop is still growing and we're just seeing a lot more vegetative, a lot more vegetation. So I thought, well, how about we just use the mcarry 2 10th percentile, so a value down there on the, the, the bottom side of that histogram as this auxiliary feature. And so that auxiliary feature was added in. Um, so in addition to the 210 spectral features, we added in this, this 211th feature, mcarry 2 10th percentile, did all the same things, trained the models. Um, I uh, Love to get into the details of all of these, but I'll just give an overview. Um, across all the algorithms, the range in root mean square error was 13.6 to 15.6 kilograms per hectare, a relative root mean square of 24 to 27. Again, the random forest was inferior to the other three models. Um, across all the models, the average root mean square error was reduced by 1.8 kilograms per hectare. So this is an 11% improvement by adding in this auxiliary feature. Uh, which I think is pretty, you know, exciting and is uh, really good results. So, um, it was a good idea to add that in. Um, taking a step back from all this, um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions here and, you know, to put this in context, you know, first, can hyperspectral imagery predict early season nitrogen uptake? We just showed that, yes, it can, and it can have very high accuracy. I was really excited to see the results of this. It is way better than, um, you know, I thought it was going to be. Um, so I was really excited. It's um, improvement upon anything I was able to see in the literature. Um, but a second question here, is hyperspectral imagery useful for making a fertilizer recommendation? My answer to that, maybe not quite as confident, um, probably. Uh, the cost of hyperspectral equipment is still high. Image capture and processing turnaround is less than ideal. And I think most important here is, uh, is little is known about early season nitrogen uptake and how that relates to upcoming crop nitrogen demand. We have, um, you know, we were able to predict nitrogen uptake, uh, but what is this relationship with nitrogen demand? I think it's important to uh, really get to, you know, this fertilizer recommendation. So the conclusions of this chapter are that last one, PLS models generally emerged as preferred, both because of their superior prediction accuracy and more efficient tuning. Uh, nitrogen update Uptake prediction accuracy was improved over other reports in the literature using remote sensing techniques. However, I will say like a lot of times cross-validation results aren't provided. And so it's really difficult to make uh, apples to apples comparison. I think it's something that, um, you know, agricultural research in general, we have to work on to provide more cross-validation results. Okay, and then finally, uh, the, the last chapter, chapter four, uh, treating image processing like hyperparameter optimization, the influence of processing workflow on prediction accuracy. Uh, the motivation here, you know, remote sensing analysts, they're, you know, we're expected to ensure that image processing has been performed to a reasonable degree before proceeding with analysis. But many analysis, even those very experienced, find themselves asking them, uh, you know, when is it good enough? Uh, when can I stop doing image processing? Do I have to keep on going or not? Uh, also, which image processing steps are more important? And uh, finally, how should a particular processing step be implemented for my particular use case for predicting nitrogen uptake? 
And so this, uh, you know, this experiment is really looking to address these questions. The objectives um, specifically were to identify the process and steps that have the greatest influence on prediction error. So the final model error, which processing steps uh, influence that the most. And then second, to quantify the influence of hundreds of image processing workflow scenarios on final prediction error. Now to do this, I uh, streamlined or I, I put together the image processing and the model training all in one workflow and then use uh, Minnesota Supercomputing Institute resources to generate all the data, train all the models, and then get to the place where we can analyze the results. This created about 10 terabytes of data, so the, the MSI resources were crucial. So continuing what we learned from chapter three, using the same use case, aerial hyperspectral imagery to predict early season corn nitrogen uptake, we did add in a couple data sets. Um, uh, Wells 2019 was the biggest one. So the total ex for experimental observations in this study, we had eight data sets, still two years, three experiments, 407 observations, increased from 247 across five growth stages, again, V6 to V14. Sampling was always within four days of image capture, and then we always captured it around solar noon. <clears throat> So you saw this image processing workflow chart already. Uh, and the only thing different here is the bin step. And I'm gonna go through each of these to kind of, to, to be able to set up like exactly what I did. So at each of these image processing steps, there's I kind of look at it as a fork in the road. We can process the imagery in one of many different ways. Um, so I'll go through each of these processing steps. First, converting to reflectance. The two scenarios were using the closest panel and the all panels or taking the mean across all panels. So here we're seeing some imagery uh, captured over one trial and the flight plan. And if we just look within one of these colored boxes here, this orange box, there's actually three hyperspectral images here. And there's uh, one reference panel. So the closest panel approach would uh, correct or convert these three images to reflectance using only that panel. And then when we go to a different colored box, there's three images here, we use that panel. The all panels approach takes the mean across all of these captured on this particular image campaign, takes the mean and then applies it to all the images. Uh, the second step, the cropping step. Um, the, the two scenarios here were cropping by plot boundary. Uh, shown here, the, the blue lines would be the crop boundaries. And this includes four corn rows in this particular situation. Um, and would include those rows that probably have some sort of an edge effect going on that we see in a lot of these uh, trials. The edges cropped um, is only looking at the two corn rows that were used that we captured the or collected the ground truth samples. So shown in the white box here. The question is, should we go through the extra effort to crop the images by the sampling extent rather than the plot extent? The next step clipping, uh, either do no spectral clipping, clip only the ends, or third, uh, clip the ends plus these oxygen and water absorption bands. Smoothing, really straightforward. Perform smoothing, don't perform smoothing. Uh, the bin step, this is the new one. Um, and I just wanna discuss this for a little bit. Uh, the, the first one, no spectral binning. Uh, the second, spectral mimic, uh, Sentinel 2A. This, the idea here is that we have hyperspectral data uh, that uh, is expressed by this green line here. Um, but there's many other sensors. Uh, so the Sentinel-2A is a satellite sensor. It's multispectral. And with hyperspectral and the specifications of that Sentinel-2A sensor, we have the opportunity really to manipulate this hyperspectral imagery so that it mimics the Sentinel-2A multispectral imagery so that we can you know, see the data that would have been collected theoretically if we would have had a multispectral sensor. And so that's what this process is doing. And then the third step is a spectral bin at 20 nanometers. So instead of having two nanometer spectral resolution and 240 bands, we have a 20 nanometer resolution and something like 20 bands or so. And then finally, this last step is the segmentation step. Uh, there's really, I think, an infinite number of ways that we could perform segmentation. And just remind you that in chapter three, we use the MCARI 2 greater than 90th percentile. Uh, hopefully that looks familiar. Uh, and we just evaluated, you know, no segmentation, you know, some different NDVI approaches. NDVI has a good relationship with biomass um, and some different MCARI 2 approaches. And then we had some multi-step 
approaches then as well. So altogether, we have all these different forks in the road uh, and all these different processing steps. Uh, and there were altogether 648 workflow scenarios evaluated. So every image was processed 648 times. There were 648 models trained and built so that we could uh, evaluate the results. So following image processing, we took the mean reflectance spectrum, uh, proceeded with supervised regression learning. We used lasso and partial least squares regression models based on results from the last chapter. And then feature selection, hyperparameter tuning, everything was done similar to how it was in chapter three. Okay, so the results. Um, this so we did a sensitivity analysis uh, to show that you know to find out which steps were most important, which ones had the most sensitivity to the final model result, and uh, the segmentation and binning steps uh, had the most influence. And so you know this just tells me that okay, this is the area where we should probably focus more attention is on these steps, you know, compared to the other steps. Uh, another thing that I did, um, you know, for each. Uh, processing step is built an empirical cumulative density function. Uh, and so we're seeing here just for the reference panel step, um, we see the, the orange and the blue lines correspond to the two scenarios at this step, the closest panel and the all panels. And this cumulative density function is just showing the root mean square error value for each of the 648 models stacked up in order uh, of each other. And so each line represents you know, the the, cumul the cumulative root mean square error for each reference panel scenario, and it's averaged across all of these other uh, image processing steps. And what this shows us is that, you know, first of all, we can see the, the lowest error and the highest error for this particular uh, step, uh, about 14.3, and the, the highest is about close to 20 uh, root mean square error. And second, when we compare the, the blue line to the orange line, we see a difference in slope, especially at these low error values. And low error is good. Um, and so we wanna see you know, more of our models over here. Uh, and so when we did the all panels approach, we see that we have lower error values than if we did the closest panel approach. This tells me that, okay, the all panels approach seems to be better um, you know, for, in this particular case. And now I did this for, you know, of course, every processing step, but I can't get into all of those details. There's a lot of really interesting things to look at, I think. Um, but, you know, asking uh, what was the optimal workflow scenario, I just want to point out each of these. So at the reference panel step, it was to, uh, you know, take uh, the mean of all panels. At the cropping step, it was worth it to remove the edge effect and just crop the edges out. Um, the clipping step, skip it, you know, use the whole full hyperspectral data set uh, was the best. The smoothing was to perform smoothing, no spectral binning, again, use the full hyperspectral data set. And then the best uh, segmentation step was actually this two-step process, uh, M carry two greater than the 90th. And then second step was take the, the green greater than the 75th. Uh, and so I put all, you know, I put, uh, found the, the best case scenario with the lowest error, the worst case scenario with the highest error. And then I wanted to compare, okay, what did I do in chapter three, this more naive approach? And so skipping all the details of like which steps they actually were, I just kind of focus on the results. Uh, the root mean square error across scenarios ranged from 14.3 kilograms per hectare to 19.8 kilograms per hectare. And the optimal processing workflow actually reduced root mean square error 2.2 kilograms per hectare that's 15.4% compared to this naive processing workflow that I used in chapter three. So this was, you know, like as much of an expert as I would consider myself, you know, still pretty, I thought interesting because, you know, optimizing for this still, you know, showed me that, okay, you know, I really have no idea. And this whole protocol, this whole process helped me uh, get to the best. And so leading into the, the third conclusion here, you know, using, using this framework uh, really can help remote sensing analysts improve model performance and provide a data-driven justification for reproducibility and objectivity. Uh, and then, you know, I just want to point out this framework is an analogous to hyperparameter tuning and machine learning, where we're just looking at all of the possible uh, workflow scenarios, all the processing scenarios, and just trying to optimize for our particular use case. 
Okay, and so that concludes uh, chapter four. And now finally, I just wanna uh, leave some concluding remarks and, and maybe some future direction here before wrapping up. Um, getting back to the overarching goal, we wanna improve nitrogen fertilizer recommendations. Um, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, this solves the world's problems or anything, but I, I do think it provides some uh, good insights and improves our understanding of the problem, at least a couple particular aspects of it. Um, you know, mainly the uncertainty around the EONR in some of these Minnesota soils. Uh, second, the relationships between EONR and grain yield metrics. You know, if we can continue to understand more about that and eventually get to a place where we can predict EONR early in the season, um, I think that's the goal. Uh, third, from an agronomics perspective, you know, the magnitude of the EONR uncertainty, which we saw was relatively high compared to nitrogen savings when considering the social costs was relatively low. You know, I think we have to take a hard look at that, uh, you know, when considering some of these social costs and understand, you know, what is the real problem here and, you know, like what is the best solution um, going forward. Uh, fourth, early season uh, inventory of crop nitrogen uptake. Uh, as, as was seen, we are able to predict nitrogen uptake with the remote sensing uh, information. Uh, this can be helpful for nitrogen budgeting and understanding in-season nitrogen uptake, you know, can help us understand uh, better the nitrogen cycle as we move through the season. And five, the influence of image processing on final model accuracy. Some steps are more important than others, and I propose a uh, solution to find really the optimal. Some of the unanswered questions, uh, you know, is there a relationship between early season nitrogen uptake and optimal nitrogen fertilizer rate? I think this is important for making that final recommendation. I think it's something that's crucially important going forward. Uh, another question I have, you know, can the uncertainty around EONR estimates be reduced? Uh, you know, does this mean like maybe improving our experimental protocols to get a better representation of EONR. Can we consider some covariates, you know, to maybe reduce that uncertainty a little bit? You know, things like uh, um, yield at the zero nitrogen rate, like I had shown. Uh, three, does the optimal image processing workflow change for different use cases? You know, I showed nitrogen uptake for hyperspectral imagery. We use different imagery, you know, different experiments, different response variables. Does that change? And then finally, uh, can hyperspectral imagery be used to train a prediction model? Then can we deploy that model using imagery acquired from a different sensor? And what I specifically mean with this is that step where uh, the binning step in chapter four, where I introduced the spectral mimic of the Sentinel 2A sensor. You know, every time a new sensor is deployed, every time a new satellite goes up, you know, we kind of have to start back at square one to, okay, get more ground truth data, which is very expensive to come by. Um, and instead, maybe if we start creating a historical data set of hyperspectral imagery, uh, and then if we can do a mimic um, of this new sensor that's out and hit the ground running, so to speak, with having, uh, you know, a trained model using historical data based on hyperspectral, uh, we can hit the ground running and deploy that. But the question is, you know, what is the loss in accuracy when doing this? Okay, I'd like to uh, end by uh, just acknowledging uh, first the funding uh, resources, MinDrive Global Food Ventures and the University of Minnesota Informatics Institute, Minnesota Department of Agriculture, Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council, Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, and then some others, uh, the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute for resources uh, for chapter four. Um, definitely my committee, uh, C and David, um, especially um, for advising me. Um, and then uh, other committee members, Dan and Fabian, um, without, you know, they provided a lot of, uh, a lot of data for me going back to 2012 to do this. And I might've been able to do all this, you know, without that, but, this experimental data is very hard to come by. It's expensive, it takes a lot of time. We can only get it once a year. Uh, and so having all of those observations made these data sets much more rich. Um, and then finally, uh, Joe Knight um, helped me with a lot of the remote sensing aspects. Um, uh, others I'd like to acknowledge, uh, Jeff Vetch at the Southern Research and Outreach Center and everybody down there um, 
for help with my Wasika treatment or experiments. Of course, the soil, water, and climate field crew, um, you know, just it just makes it a lot easier to, to process all of these, collect the data, process them, and, and get the job done. Um, it's, it's something that is underappreciated for sure, I think. Um, the Agrobot uh, lab, visiting scholars, postdoc student workers, everybody that's come through CAing's lab uh, to help with these projects. A uh, special shout out to Ali. Uh, he's now an assistant professor at UC Davis. Uh, him and I struggled for three years to try to get hyperspectral imagery with a drone. Um, and uh, we went through a lot of trials and tribulations together. Uh, and then finally, uh, a few graduate students uh, that I'd like to point out, Isam and Gabriel helping a lot with field trials, uh, Brian, and then uh, my fiance, uh, Leanna Leverich. Um, perhaps the best thing to come out of my <laughs> PhD here is I got to meet her. And then also my uh, parents, I'd like to thank them for raise, uh, raising me on a farm and um, bringing me into this whole area. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate everybody, uh, you know, tuning in and, and listening, and I will uh, take questions now. All right, uh, very good, Tyler. Thank you for the presentation. And if we can all maybe give a virtual round of applause in the reactions button there at the bottom of the screen. And uh, if you have questions, um, I believe the mic is open or you can also type it in the uh, chat box and I can read the questions. Yeah, now you can unmute yourself and uh, if you have questions, please feel free to, to just ask. Tyler, I got a question. This is Tish Gupta. Yes. Hey, very good job. A lot of work. Congratulations. Um, just a big, big picture question. What's the future of precision farming? Um, I think the future of precision farming, I think uh, the, the first thing that I think is being done um, and is really important is just to collect, uh, get, get a database uh, uh, built up and collected of high quality data. So we can use some of these machine learning uh, protocols to, uh, to be able to make predictions really on anything. Um, in short, you know, I think it's br bringing some of these statistical approaches, these machine learning approaches, put it into the hands of the agronomists. The ones that boots on the ground, you know, are seeing the day-to-day -day things. Uh, we know in agriculture, you know, you move across the road, it seems, and you see something different. Every year we see something different. And so just to bring that power into the agronomist's hands is, I think, the future. Okay, my second question is that, um, you know, one of the reasons for variability is the precept climate differences from year to year. And uh, even if you get a, some database and that's what, uh, you know, extension people and fertility people have been doing, they've been laying down the plots and running mm -hmm. on a larger scale than you are doing it. So what's the difference? I mean, they come up with a recommendation and you're going to come up with a recommendation and we go to a next year, a same plot, we just still have a variability. So how do we take care of the climate? interaction part that we cannot predict. Yeah, so I mean, that's, yeah, that's the grand challenge, I suppose. Um, and, you know, from, uh, you know, an algorithmic perspective, uh, you know, what we're seeing every, every year we get different weather and we're always pushing the boundaries of these constraints of our models. And so what we see every new year, uh, it's outside of our assumptions, uh, outside of our constraints that we already have. Uh, yeah, and so I think what you're asking is like, you know, is it better to, you know, just kind of use these regional, you know, averages and maybe ignore to some extent the spatial variability we see, or to kind of look at this, uh, you know, at the field scale. Um, and, you know, that, that I think they're both important, um, you know, for their own reasons, you know, regional analysis is certainly uh, important to kind of see how things are happening on the grand scale. Um, 
And yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't have a good answer other than just to like, uh, you know, continue working at it, continue to improving these models uh, with new weather data. I mean, we are getting new weather data every year. Uh, you know, I don't know if hope is the right word, but hope that we see less climate variability uh, in the future. So we have more years that aren't outside of those constraints. So, Thank you. Question. That was a, yeah, no, that, that's a good job. I mean, you did a very well, uh, very nice job on your thesis. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Tyler, there is a question here in the chat box uh, from Brian Bowman. Do you think that the improvement in model performance in chapter four due to optimizing the processing pipeline justifies the increased computing costs of the image processing pipeline? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, for all the work I, I did necessarily to I, more or less develop everything. Um, but, you know, we do this stuff to build off of each other and, you know, build off of each other's work. And, you know, the next time this is done, you know, a lot of the groundwork is, is laid. And, you know, frankly, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the costs are because, you know, the MSI resources are free to me as a student. Um, and, you know, once I got it all set up, like, you know, those 10 terabytes of data, everything was generated in a matter of four hours. Um, granted, it took me about 13 months to get to that point. Um, so, but yeah, absolutely. And I think like if, you know, if we can get this more automated and, and more streamlined for different use cases and different data sets, yes. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. I'll ask a question. Um, very nice job, Tyler. Very impressive, but it was um, very well done. Uh, I have a basic question um, related to the first chapter where you have uh, two models. You can use the quadratic plateau or a quadratic model. How do you decide which one you're going to use and which one did you use in your second chapter when you determine uh, yeah. E O and R? Yep, good question. So I just um, used, so calculated the, well, the R squared and the root mean squared error of the model fit. Uh, and actually the one that I chose, it's part of the, the package, the E O and R package. Uh, it, it chooses the one that has the lower root mean square error. So whichever one has a better fit. Um, and uh, yeah, there were, you know, I want to say five of the data sets use the quadratic model and the remaining use the quadratic plateau model for chapter two. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Cause I know when, when you compare the two, you'll get different EO and R's. And so. <laughs> yeah. Generally the quadratic there's some model. subjectivity going on in there. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I, I personally think, uh, you know, I've been, uh, I, I suppose, um, pressured and, convinced that okay to do this approach looking at both quadratic and quadratic and choose the one that has the better model fit um, at least in corn this changes with different crops of course but with corn i think i think it's it's justifiable just to always use the quadratic plateau model the reason is you know <laughs> put a treatment with a thousand pounds of nitrogen on you know we're not going to have negative yield or whatever that quadratic <laughs> response is you know Right. The thing is, we're just not, we're, when we're having a quadratic response, I don't think in corn, we're having a range of nitrogen rates sufficient to capture that. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Do we have time for another question, yes, Bobby? Yes, uh, Melissa, go ahead. Hi, Tyler. Hi. So, I'm a manure management specialist, and knowing that you grew up on a farm that has animals, I'm curious how you would potentially make adjustments to account for the other nutrient source manure application for your EONR model. Uh, so for the EONR model, how to consider uh, manure in there as well. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I would say, you know, it's tough because it's like a slow release fertilizer kind of a thing. And, you know, the simplest is just to have like a fixed source, you know, when doing these things uh, when doing the EONR estimates. So how would I address that? Um, you know, it would, uh, <laughs> I put an asterisk up on the top, I guess, that manure was one of the sources or the predominant source. Um, I, you know, I think 
with manure, you know, it gets into second year manure credits, third year manure credits, and, you know, considering manure as more of a holistic <laughs> fertilizer source, um, it's just different than a lot of the commercial fertilizers. Um, and just a different cropping, not different cropping system, but just different management system that um, I would expect, you know, maybe you're looking for what I expect in the UNR, it, expect it to decrease substantially and have a much higher yield at the zero nitrogen rate. So, you know, with manure in the system. Tyler, there is one last question uh, in the chat box from um, Carol. What other scientific areas or others could benefit from this type of data that was collected, the hyperspectral imagery? Um, okay, so what other scientific areas? Uh, so I, yeah, I just looked at a precision egg use case uh, for predicting nitrogen uptake. Uh, you know, there's there's work using hyperspectral area uh, imagery to predict uh, soil moisture uh, before planting. You know, based on the color and the the type of the soil. So th that's one thing. You know, there's ecological applications. You know, looking at species mapping of um, you know forestry and and, and prairies. Uh, things like that, uh, you know, in, in more in agriculture, uh, you know, any biophysical parameter of interest, um, it might be biomass, it might be canopy cover, it might be nitrogen uptake, nitrogen concentration. Uh, in potatoes, potato growers manage on petiole nitrate oftentimes, and so, you know, using the imagery to help predict uh, petiole nitrate, you know, to help uh, evaluate the spatial variability there. Um, really, I think it's, you know, almost infinite. Uh, granted that there's trade, you know, like the ability of the imagery to uh, predict some of those uh, response variables, you might be better or worse, just depending on other challenges. So. Very good. Thank you, Tyler, and thank you, everybody, for participating. There are a lot of uh, uh, congratulations and notes in the chat box for you, Tyler. Uh, but uh, let's uh, conclude this, this portion of uh, the presentation for today. Again, thank you, and um, feel free to sign out. Okay, thank you, everyone, for attending.